Welcome to Inside Scoop, Virginia. My name is George Burke, and uh, I'll be your host for the next hour. Uh, I'm quite pleased tonight to have two very good friends of mine, my county supervisor, Penny Gross, and my <laughs> delegate from the 38th <laughs> District, Bob Hall. And uh, I'm proud to have him here. Penny Gross uh, was first elected uh, to the Board of Supervisors in 1995 elected again in 99 in 2003 and she's up this year she does have a republican opponent i expect her to be victorious in november but i urge everyone in mason district to get out there and work for her penny is does a lot of work uh, in a lot of different areas uh, and we'll be talking about that tonight so i'm not going to belabor the the biography but i do want to note that she is a member of the board of directors uh, of the uh, Washington Council of Governments, the Virginia Association of Counties, and the Northern Virginia Regional Commission. But there is much, much more to Penny Gross, and you'll hear about that tonight. Uh, my other guest, Bob Hull, was first elected to the House of Delegates in 1992 in a special election. Mm -hmm. He replaced Leslie Byrne in that seat. Leslie ran uh, for Congress and won the congressional seat this, that year. It's your seventh term you're running for, I believe, Bob. Uh, Actually, Bob's eighth, 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 eighth full term. Eighth full term. Eighth full term. term. Yeah. And uh, uh, Bob is a, a creature unique. To Northern Virginia. Uh, he was born and raised here. Most That's of us right. are carpetbaggers from one time or another. Uh, you got to really dig through the weeds to find somebody who was born here. Uh, Bob serves on the Finance Committee, another committee that's very important to Fairfax County is the County, Cities, and Towns Committee. Uh, and he served, prior to getting elected the first time, he served 19 years on different county boards and commissions. Mm -hmm. So I welcome both of you to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank like you, George. Home day. Delighted to be here. The, uh, we do have, uh, we are taking calls tonight, and that number is 571 749 1166. Uh, let's get into it a little bit. One of my favorite topics on this show lately has been the uh, transportation bill. Uh, you know, we hear the talk about the abuser fees, we hear a lot of different things and a lot of rhetoric. Well, there, I have two people with us tonight who've been involved in a lot of transportation issues, are very familiar with the bill, and may be telling you some stuff uh, that you haven't heard before. Let's get right into it. Penny, Tell me what you think of the transportation bill before we let our <laughs> delegate talk about what happened down there. The transportation bill, George, was disappointing to say the very least. However, the bill that finally did pass was better than the one that started out. Um, you know, originally the um, transportation bill had in it what localities considered a poison pill. And that was that the localities would have to take over operation and maintenance of their own roads, which is a state responsibility. It was a little bit like, you know, this potato is too hot. Here, you take it. Mm -hmm. And um, localities across the, the, the Commonwealth, and this came out in the Virginia Association of Counties Board of Directors meeting, it didn't matter whether you were from Fairfax, the largest jurisdiction, or were you from Wythe County or someplace way down in the southwest section, nobody wanted this poison pill and we were e effective in getting rid of that part mm -hmm. but the rest of it was not really what we had would have liked but we worked real hard to get a package of um, um, resources for both the northern virginia and tidewater that would be somewhat similar it seemed that uh, the republicans uh, who have been unsuccessful for some time in passing any kind of transportation mm -hmm. bill uh, were reluctant to uh, attach any revenue to this bill that was uh, that was uh, equitable and fair from a statewide basis. A lot of it has been put on the shoulders of Northern Virginia. A lot of it has been put on the shoulders of, the, of Hampton Roads. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course then there are the infamous so-called abuser fees that have a lot of people right. uh, up in arms. Uh, Bob, tell us, you know, what went on down there? Well, this is an issue that really had been around for about three years. Um, Governor Warner, uh, when he proposed his um, uh, tax reform bill, the Senate at one point added uh, a big package to take care of the transportation issue, but then that they dropped that when they got into negotiations. So um, we come to um, 2006, and uh, we had some bills that came to the Finance Committee one of the bills was the abuser fee bill, voted against that. 
Um, that was Albo and Rust. Albo and Rust. They Two had Republicans, a, I mean. Yeah, they had another bill that would have been just in Northern Virginia, would have increased a lot of fees and taxes. And um, one of the problems with that bill and the bill that finally made it out of committee this year that I also voted against was that these original bills would have taken over $100 million from the general fund. And that's mm -hmm. the uh, fund that we use for public, uh, public education. And you know, we were saying, look, if, uh, if there's a downturn in the economy and we don't have enough revenue and you have sold bonds based on money from the general fund, that comes right off the top. You've got to pay that. And so we, we would be in the position of having to cut education. We said, no, I'm not going to do that. So I voted against the bill that came out of the committee. I voted against the House version that passed the House the first time, went to the Senate, had some changes made, came back. I voted against the final bill. And it still had the money from the general fund. It had the, the provision that Penny was talking about. It had a lot of other things in it, and so uh, including the uh, abuser fees. Uh, and it went to the governor. And then instead of making amendments, see, the governor in Virginia, uh, and mo a lot of governors, uh, the president cannot do this, but a lot of governors can send down line amendments. They'll say, uh, I support the concept of the bill, but I would like these things changed. And then we have to vote separately on the amendments. Well, instead of doing that, he submitted what we call an amendment in the nature of a substitute, one bill up or down. And when I went, uh, we have what we call the veto session uh, six weeks after the regular session ends. And when we went to that, I was, I tell you, I was prepared to vote against it. But the governor had made substantial improvements. Had taken out the provisions Penny talked about, mm -hmm. took out the raid from the general fund. But it still had the abuser fee bill, uh, aspect of it rather, and it only related again to Virginia drivers. And it had a number of problems, but the biggest problems seemed to have been taken care of. So I ended up voting for it because we'd been working on this for three years, and I figured we'll clean up these bad aspects of it, hopefully this year. And I will tell you, that abuser fee thing has gotten so much, so much bad publicity, I'm sure that's going to be changed. But the problem is, what we're doing is we're getting away from what has been a tradition not just in Virginia, but in other states, of using the gasoline tax, which is a, more or less a user fee, mm -hmm. to pay for transportation improvements. Instead, they throw it to counties in northern Virginia and the localities in Hampton Roads to have to raise their taxes themselves. One of the taxes to be raised, and I didn't support, is that for the first time, we will put a tax on a service, in this case, automobile, automobile repairs. repairs. So there's some nexus, but my, my fear is that once you, you know, they talk about the camel's nose under the tent, once you start there, what's next? Dry cleaning, uh, legal fees, you know what I'm saying. And so if, we, if we're going to get into that, we need to look at the whole tax system. And there are a number of problems with it. I know there will be some changes this upcoming session. I'm not sure what those changes will, will be, but clearly we need to increase that gasoline tax because we don't even have a, a strong enough statewide component. We've got the two pieces in Northern Virginia and Tidewater, but we have a huge problem around the state. You take Interstate 81. We have colleges that Northern Virginia parents have children in all up and down I-81. It is a bad road, so we need a big mm -hmm. statewide component, and that transportation bill I know will be changed. George, one of the things that <coughs> happened here was that there was a simple answer to this issue, and that was to increase the gasoline tax. Which I mm -hmm. fully support. And, mm -hmm. and they made it a very complex result uh, anyway. And, and the simple fix would have been across everybody. And interestingly, Virginia prides itself on its tourism. Mm -hmm. And the gasoline tax would not only apply to those of us who drive in Virginia, but all those folks who pass through Virginia, oh, all going. those folks who may work in Virginia and live in Maryland or somewhere else, West mm -hmm. Virginia, mm -hmm. they'll buy their gasoline here. Because even, even if the gas tax was raised a few cents, it's still a lower tax than most other surrounding jurisdictions exactly have. Right. So. We really missed the boat on, on making sure that everybody who drives in mm -hmm. Virginia gets an opportunity to pay for the roads, mm -hmm. whether they live here or whether they're visiting here. And one of the things about the gasoline tax is it's not necessarily passed on because the market sets the price of the gasoline at the retail level. So if you go down to the North Carolina border, the price in Virginia and in North Carolina is exactly the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the, pri the, the tax on gasoline is higher in North Carolina. 
the market has set the price. So the taxes, the tax increase is not necessarily passed along. And even if it is, for example, you could raise the gasoline tax five and a half cents right now and be at or below all neighboring states but, but uh, Tennessee, which is a very low tax. If you increased it, and I think you'd, you'd bring in about $300 million with the five and a half cents. If you increase it to 10 cents, you still, when you're looking at gasoline prices fluctuating by 20, 25 cents, mm -hmm. that's not that bad. And look, that 10 cents, like Penny says, is a lot less than if you get caught uh, going 20 miles an hour of sure. speed limit and have to pay that abuse. <laughs> and it's equitable from the standpoint that the people who use the roads exactly. pay for it. That's exactly, exactly right. We have a call coming in from Robert from Annandale. Robert, are you there? Yes, I am. What's your question, sir? My, well, I understand about the transportation, and thank you very much for your explanation of uh, exactly where people stand. But uh, this is for Supervisor Gross. Uh, if you don't mind me mentioning this, your opponent has mentioned various things about the crime statistics in Fairfax County and how she'd like to improve them. From my standpoint, they look pretty good. Uh, can you kindly respond to that? I think we're our police force is doing a pretty good job. Thank you very much for that uh, question, Robert. Uh, I am a little perplexed when I hear um, some of the discussion that we need a 24-7 police department. I thought we had one. Uh, yeah, so did I. Um, I share space with the police department, and I don't care whether I'm in there at 1 o'clock in the morning or 6 o'clock at night or noon or whatever. They're always out there. Um, our crime rate for a jurisdiction of our size is just phenomenally low. We are one of the safest jurisdictions in the country. Mm -hmm. I think our homicide um, number last year was 19 altogether for 1.1 million people. Mm -hmm. And most of those have been resolved. Some of them were domestic. Some of them were very quickly solved. So I am really perplexed when I hear uh, folks talking about this crime wave and the unsafe county we're in. We're, it's absolutely false. We are a safe county, and my goodness, we can really be proud of our uh, police department that has not only officers on duty 24-7 patrolling, but if there is an incident, for instance, if you have a homicide or an unexplained death or a suicide, there will be a trained homicide investigator on scene within 30 minutes, anywhere in the county. Now, that sounds to me like 24-7. I think that uh, I'm, I've worked an awful lot of campaigns in my uh, lifetime, and it strikes me that this type of raising this type of issue, but when it's not true, is essentially aimed at fear-mongering. It's some of the mm -hmm. same things we're seeing on some of the other issues that are popping up this year as the Republicans desperately grasp mm -hmm. for something to put their hands on and to escape uh, from these so-called abuser fees, because they are getting hammered on mm -hmm. those. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would add also that Fairfax is um, really is an outstanding county in terms of neighborhood watch programs. Oh, yes. we have one of the best, and Mason yeah. District even better Absolutely. than the county as a whole. And I think in many regards, that's what keeps crime rate low, because you got the neighbors out there looking mm -hmm. after what's happening. Mm -hmm. The police work directly with them. In the early 1990s, there was a, 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 there was a real rash of break-ins, and that's when the Neighborhood Watch really built up. Mm -hmm. And the, the rate of I hate went to way down you, but real we're gonna, quickly. We're going to go for a break, <laughs> and we'll be back in two minutes, and we'll get back on to this crime thing. Thank you. I guess we're not. This is Mommy's bed. Me and Jenny were jumping on it. <clears throat> Mommy's gun fell on the floor. I was a cowboy. Bang, 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 bang. I said, Jenny, wake up, wake up. It's just pretend. But she wouldn't wake up. If you give me a fish, if you give someone a fish, you feed them for a day. Teach someone to fish. You feed them for a lifetime. Give me a fish, and you'll feed me for a day. Teach me to fish, and you'll feed me for a lifetime. Through Volunteers of America, you can help change lives in your community. Oh, 
Hey, mister, studied algebra in school and got a better job than I could. You take the last call. Oh, no, 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 mister. Stuck in an entry-level job because you only learned basic math. I don't have a boss riding my butt like you do, so you take it so you can get back to your desk. <laughs> you know, I probably should, but maybe Miss AP Calculus with the $200 haircut in the big office upstairs would like a cup. Oh, no, mister. What was your name again? Never mind, it doesn't matter. I'm too busy doing important things to care. I just came down for some sweet and stir. <laughs> You know, if my limited math abilities weren't keeping me from getting a better job, I'd quit this afternoon. I don't blame you. But thank goodness you're stuck here because we really need someone to make the coffee. <laughs> Joining me today are Mason District Supervisor Penny Gross and 38th District Delegate Bob Hall. Mm. Uh, we have a call from Philip. He looks like he's been waiting a while. We'll take the call, then we'll get back to talking about crime and a lot of other issues. Philip, what can we do for you tonight? Oh, thank you. Uh, I've been a uh, resident of Fairfax County for the past 30 years. Um, before you look at raising the tax, it's why don't you look at the, the um, what money is actually being wasted, what programs you can cut back on? Well, you know, that's not a bad idea. I, I, clearly, when, you, when uh, hard times hit, the first thing you do is to look for ways to, to save money out of your own budget. But then there comes a time when you, you just need the revenue. I mean, Virginia is a pay-as-you-go state. We always have them. We don't like to get heavily in debt. But you're right about that. Well, the problem is you won't find in any budget where there's a line item that says waste and abuse. <laughs> so you've got to go through it. I, I'll give you an example. When um, Governor Warner had the tax reform package, uh, it had come at a time where Governor Gilmore left office and apparently didn't let people know that things weren't quite as good as the, they looked. And he had to cut uh, budgets tremendously. And he said, I did not want to, to do an across-the-board cut because I might cut some agencies so much they wouldn't be able to fulfill their, their mission and I'd have to get rid of them. In some cases, he did. He merged agencies together. He looked at it selectively, how much of a cut here, how much of a cut there. And, I, and we think he really did a good job and he really put us on a firm foundation. And then a year later, he proposed this restructuring that uh, what it did was um, it increased you know, anytime you have a general tax and you increase it a small amount, it produces a lot of revenue. And so since it's a small increase, it doesn't hurt people that much. We increase the um, uh, general sales tax by half a penny, but then we reduce the food tax by two cents. So that kind of balanced that, that off. And we, because of that, we had a billion more dollars to put into public education. So. Uh, I, I do take that uh, suggestion seriously that you've got to look at your own operations uh, all the time. And I know at the county level, you, you do that all well, the time. Well, Philip mentioned that he lived in Fairfax County for 30 years, so he has seen the cycles that we've gone through in real estate, where things are up and then they're down and then they're up and then they're down. And so in the county, um, a few years ago, when I first joined the board, we were in a real crisis situation 12 years ago. And we had to cut the budget tremendously, um, um, tens of millions of dollars. Two of the things that we cut were the urban forester and the soil science mm -hmm. office. Well, that came back to haunt us in a way because we discovered that because of the land use in Fairfax County, right. we needed those soil scientists to tell us whether they were on marine clays and mm -hmm. things like that. And the urban forester is really a, a vital uh, a staffing component because of all of our trees, our tree legislation and so forth. So we've, over the years as we've been able to afford it, we've put it back in. But um, some of the things we have actually added to the um, budget are the gang unit, which has mm -hmm. done a tremendous job. The board established a gang unit a few years ago, has done a tremendous job in keeping our gang activity way, way down. And of course, a lot of the money has also been transferred to the schools. Mm -hmm. But in carryover in September, we had some money that was not spent in the last budget, and we actually put that aside 
so that we can have hopefully some tax relief again in the next in the FY09 budget. So well, we're being, being very, very prudent. And, and let me say that, that that's with a Democratic majority and in the General Assembly and in Richmond, it was a Democrat, Governor Wilder, who proposed the so-called Rainy Day Fund. You know, people talk about Democrats, uh, uh, that, you know, the idea that somehow we're not good with your tax dollars is just not true. Governor Wilder proposed that Rainy Day Fund and it has really saved us because we're able to squirrel away some money so when the slow times hit, we can draw some of that out without having to necessarily cut programs. And the county has basically the county a has a, thing. a revenue stabilization fund that we established back in about 10 years ago. We now have fully funded it. It's, it's sort of hard sometimes to describe it, but you know, we've had two incidents just in the last six or seven years that have proven why we need to have a revenue stabilization fund. One was 9-11. 9-11 proved that sometimes you have incredible disasters that you had no planning right. for and you need to be able to ha access some resources. The other was the experience that the people in New Orleans had with uh, Hurricane Katrina and then following up with Hurricane Rita. Mm -hmm. Wiped out wiped out whole entire counties, entire local jurisdictions. No way to provide for um, police services, no way to provide for school services. They had no money to do anything. They were wiped out and several years later they're still struggling. Mm -hmm. So we know that a revenue stabilization mm -hmm. fund is the prudent approach. Mm -hmm. the, uh, we had touched upon the issue of uh, lobbyists in Richmond <coughs> and uh, the county of course has a number of people who are actually regular employees I believe who lobby yeah. down they're not there. lobbyists they're rep uh, representatives they're legislative Re representatives yeah. <laughs> and uh, a funny story that I did want to uh, relay to folks there was a debate between board chairman Jerry Connolly and his Republican opponent uh, recently uh, before the Chamber of Commerce and uh, uh, Chairman Connolly spent a couple of minutes talking about the Fairfax's lobbying presence in Richmond and his opponent took great umbrage over that, uh, clearly not quite knowing what the position was and how in fact it operated. And he made a blanket statement, he's a lawyer, usually lawyers don't ask questions they don't have the answers to. And he said, well, we've got members of the General Assembly here. What do they think? And Bob Hull was in the audience, and he typed up, I think it's great, <laughs> through a big <laughs> laughter, a round of applause, and sort of ended that. Uh, unfortunately for Bob, when the Washington Post reported it, they didn't mention your name. <laughs> That's right. And I had specifically, yeah, I thought, I, told Bill I, Turk it was you, the reporter from the Post yeah. afterwards. But tell us a little bit more about this lobbying Well, operation. we depend on them because... Uh, frankly, <laughs> if it wasn't for them uh, being able to review bills, uh, the county might get its clock cleaned. Because there are people around the state that think that somehow uh, all this tax money that comes to Richmond flows back to Fairfax County when the opposite is true. That's right. Mm -hmm. We pay for services all over the state. We pay for schools in every rural county in this county. We get about 20 cents on yeah. the dollar back. And so uh, w those folks are able to review these bills, particularly the budget, review the, the items in the budget, and let us know what's going on, let the Board of Supervisors right. know what's going on. And so when a bill comes up before a committee, I'm on the County Cities and Towns Committee. Karen Harwood, who's with the County Attorney's Office, is there for every meeting. When land use matters come up, she can speak about Fairfax's experience. And it is an invaluable experience to have a person like that. So if we didn't have those folks down there, uh, I tell you, other parts of this uh, Commonwealth would just grab anything they could from us. We have in the county um, about five people who are um, work. They have other jobs, mm -hmm. and during the session, they are sent down to Richmond. I I wouldn't want to be down in Richmond those <laughs> two months of the session, but well, they're down there all. I know you do, and so do they. <laughs> but they come back every Friday afternoon to meet with the board in as a legislative committee to tell us what's going on and to look at how, what our positions are mm -hmm. and what kinds of um, legislation is working its through the way through the pipeline. One of the things that we have found is that not only are our Fairfax County legislative people absolutely top notch, mm -hmm. but they provide similar services for counties around the, co the Commonwealth. Yeah. I had mentioned the Virginia Association of Counties. They work closely with the VACO mm -hmm. 
folks. And sometimes they even are able to help the very small counties that have no legislative representatives with their own uh, legislation because they're there. Mm -hmm. They have become known and recognized as experts in the field. And so they're down there for that, those couple of months. And when they, the session is finished, they come back and take over their regular positions. We have somebody from, the depart from our Department of Transportation. Mm -hmm. We have somebody from Human Services. We have somebody from Budget. You know, we have these folks who are really top-notch county employees who do that as an extra, I guess, job description. It's, right. other, it's almost other duties as assigned. And they do a remarkable job, and they're recognized across the Commonwealth. Particularly human services, because Fairfax uh, really operates a lot of programs right. on its own, instead of the state having to do mm -hmm. it. So it's critical to have them down there. And, and some of this is so complex, so complicated. We have to have somebody who can pull away the, 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 the layers and get right down to the nitty gritty. The years I spent in uh, working for the, the House of Representatives, working for the Congress, mm -hmm. uh, I learned that lobbyist is not necessarily a dirty word, no. that, oh, that no. lobbyists provide many, many valuable services uh, to the elected branch in terms of, because they often have the expertise that you can't expect an individual legislator to have. And the information. And the information. An elected official is a generalist. We That's really, right. it's a very general, exactly we right. deal with very general issues. We need to have that expertise. And that's what we get from mm -hmm. folks who are lobbyists. And it sounds to me that the folks that come down from Fairfax aren't your prototypical slicksters in their not Gucci's. At all. So not, not at all. <laughs> not we don't pay them enough <laughs> to do that. <laughs> well, the, uh, you know, we had talked about the police before, and before the break, I just want to put a plug in. I mean, uh, the public services in Fairfax are some of the best in the United States, if not in the world anyway. Well, That's the right. training's outstanding. And, and you know, I, uh, I spent some time working with the firefighters, mm -hmm. so I know the Fairfax firefighters as well as many others, and these folks are just top-notch. They're one of the two uh, USAR teams, urban search and rescue yes. teams, that actually get to go, uh, go around, around the, the world. world. Not that they go to fun places, they go to yeah. disasters and they're dealing That's with right. disease and cave-ins and the like. Uh, but they definitely uh, deserve our respect and the like. And when we return uh, after the next break, let's, one of the issues that deals with our public safety personnel is affordable housing. Yes, indeed. And, uh, you know, I think we should spend a little time with that. Uh, so we hope you'll stick with us. We'll be back in two minutes. Uh, urge you to phone us at 571-749-1166 if you have the time. Uh, thank you for joining us, and we shall see you after the break. Some people in Fairfax County don't know what public access means. Some think it's just another channel on the dial. But it's much more than that. It's the voice of the people. People like you. Your neighbors. Your friends. Or your family. People who want to share ideas. Opinions. Cultures. Lifestyles. Art. Sports. Music. Events. Entertainment. History. Science. Beliefs. People who want to learn about television. Producing. Directing. Cameras. Audio. Lighting. Editing. Or radio. Talk. Music. Whatever you think people should hear. Public access is the place where everyone has a voice. And it's the place where that voice gets heard. A place where you can create your own form of personal expression. So what do you want to say? Whatever it is. You can say it here. Because we're public access. For the people. By the people. It is about balancing our choices between the gray of the concrete jungle and the stunning beauty of the real one. Between a stoic facade of granite and the fury of the canyon. It's why there's Earthshare, the simple way to find balance. Earthshare is the workplace giving program bringing the leading environmental groups under one umbrella. Support Earthshare, support them all. Earthshare, please ask your employer about workplace giving. To learn more, visit our website. Thousands of kids in this country have everything it takes to go to college. Except the money. The United Negro College Fund. 
A mind is a terrible thing to waste. Welcome back to Inside Scoop, Virginia. I'm your host, George Burke. I'm joined by Mason District Supervisor Penny Gross and 38th District Delegate Bob Hall. Again, this is my supervisor and my <laughs> delegate, so I'm happy to have him on today. And we will be victorious in November. Before uh, the break, we were talking a little bit about uh, public safety and the police officers. We had talked about them earlier and the crime issue. Uh, but you raised during the break the training that the firefighters receive here in Fairfax. You know, the training that we put into both the fire academy and the police academy is just phenomenal. It is, um, I think in some cases it's four to six months long. It is intense. And when you come out of that training, you are ready to serve mm -hmm. the people okay. of Fairfax County. That is an investment that the people of Fairfax County put into these young men and women who are going to serve us for the next 20 or 25 or 30. I have one constituent who's been in the fire services for 36 years. Mm -hmm. He has young children, so he says he still has to stay around. But it's an investment, and that's why when we talk about affordable housing for our, our um, mm -hmm. public safety and, and teachers and so forth, we need to continue that investment. If we're going to put that much investment into their training, we want them to stay around. They need some place to live. It's, it's a problem in many areas such like Fairfax around the country uh, where, well, let's face it, our housing values are high. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, people may sometimes complain about their property taxes, but the reality of the matter is uh, their property taxes go up, not because the tax rate go up, the tax rates yeah. drop it's dramatically, mm -hmm. but the because their value goes yeah. up. And you know, we all understand that, and I think everybody's happy about that. Uh, on the affordable housing issue, though, it happens in a lot of places where people cannot, uh, local employees of government cannot afford to live in their communities. It's not just Fairfax County. It happens in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. It happens uh, in, in Greenwich, Connecticut. It happens in Bergen County, New All Jersey. Over the there are many places like that. Um, but and you know the difference? The difference is, and, and I know that the county saw this after 9-11, have so many firefighters and emergency personnel living in Front Royal, Culpeper, uh, some even in West Virginia. Pennsylvania. Yeah, mm -hmm. that when you, uh, yeah, people live near Gettysburg actually mm -hmm. come down here. And so when 9-11 happened, and, and the thing about 9-11 is that happened in this area because of Washington. So the Pentagon was here, all of the, the you know, ca capital, everything was right mm -hmm. here. So if there's an emergency, we have to call folks in, and they're, they're living way out there. Transportation becomes then be a high. homeland mm -hmm. security mm -hmm. issue. Mm -hmm. Affordable housing becomes a, an, mm -hmm. a, a homeland security issue because if, if they can afford to live here, they'd be closer to respond to a, a big emergency like that. And I think the county has done a great job in putting funds aside for that. But let me tell you that when the idea first came up in the General Assembly several years ago, Arlington brought it forward. They wanted to spend their own money to help their employees with some of the costs of, of buying housing. Oh my God, they had to have a bill to do it. See. We're yeah. in a Dillon rural yeah. state. We can't yeah. do that without enabling legislation yeah. from the General Assembly. And you would have thought from hearing from folks elsewhere in the state that it was some kind of socialist idea <laughs> when it was their own money. They said, we will not use state funds. We will not use federal funds. We'll use our own money. It's supported by our people. We've had hearings about this. And then after a couple of years, we finally were able to allow them to do it. And now Fairfax has really stepped up to play. Well, think. in Fairfax, over the last three years, we have carved out one cent of the tax rate for affordable housing, mm -hmm. for preservation and, and building of affordable housing. This year, that's $22.9 million. That's the value of one cent on the tax rate. So we've done the same thing for stormwater, and we'll get into environment <laughs> later. But that is a significant investment mm -hmm. in preserving, especially apartments, that are ready to revert to market rate because their HUD mortgages have been have been um, fulfilled, and so now they can revert to market rate. We've bought several mm -hmm. uh, apartment complexes. We had a thousand units, a goal of a thousand units in four years. We are now in less than four years at about 1,500 units. So we wow. really have been aggressive, working with nonprofits. It's not just that the county is buying these. Mm -hmm. We're working with nonprofits in partnerships so that they will manage them. Mm -hmm. They put some of their money into it. But we need to do more. The, the home ownership piece is one that is still we're struggling with because 
the we're trying to preserve rental housing right now mm -hmm. the next step yeah. is to get into affordable um, uh, housing that you purchase and we do have affordable dwelling unit ordinance and we do have we've just adjusted our um, ordinance to provide for high-rises especially mm -hmm. at metro stops when you build a high-rise you now are going to have to provide 12 percent mm -hmm. of the units are going to have to be affordable that is a huge step forward now we don't have anything on the ground yet because that we only passed that about two weeks ago but it is going to make a significant sure. difference um, we need again going back to our teachers our firefighters our police officers our nurses we want them to be able to live near closer to where they want to work we also want them to have the choice yeah, and absolutely. sometimes people do choose to live somewhere else because quite frankly they want to get away from their daily job they need to you know be sure. be have some respite but overall we need to make sure that the housing choice is available so that if you want an apartment or a condo as a young family it's available you want to buy a house it's available you want to buy a bigger house with acreage you can do that it's the it's a matter of choice let's take a call here we have Bridget from Falls Church on the line Bridget how are you doing Hi. today good I was wondering um, what you guys like most about your job Oh, what we, oh, like, what most we like most about our jobs. <laughs> well, you know, one of the things I've always said, and I've worked, I spent my entire professional life before I got elected as a supervisor, I, I worked on the Hill for members of Congress, very well-known members of Congress, who were great statesmen. Mm -hmm. And I figured, you know, I, I, I watched what they did, and I was really glad that we were from somewhere far away and, and weren't living amongst your constituents. When I got elected, I suddenly realized I'm right in the midst of my constituents. Mm -hmm. And every day you get up knowing it's going to be a new day and you're not quite sure what's going to happen, you use every ounce of energy and every brain cell you have. And that's exciting. That keeps you juiced up all the time. And I'd say that's probably my favorite thing is that I'm using my skills and my talents all the time and it doesn't matter whether it's on transportation or somebody who needs housing or somebody who just calls with a really crazy question that provides a little um, humor it it and I'm Bridget yours isn't a, yours isn't a crazy question I'm talking about people who call my office um, but it is just an exciting job because you're able to help people and every day there's a new challenge yeah, I, I feel. I, I imagine Bob doesn't like his commute to Richmond. That's the <laughs> most, uh, best part of his job. No, I actually, gosh, you know, I, I was thinking the other day how many times I've made that trip to, up and down 95 over the last 15 years. You know, it's incredible. But I, I have a similar experience. I mean, a lot of people like to go down to the General Assembly and speak on the great issues of the day. Well, that's great, and I participate in the debates on the floor, but. The thing that satisfies me the most is when I'm able to help an individual mm -hmm. constituent or a group of constituents. Uh, for example, occasionally a bill will be introduced that people make fun of. We had one delegate uh, a few years ago that introduced what they call the baggy pants bill. It was about <laughs> preventing young men from wearing these you know, low-cut trousers, baggy trousers, and people made fun of them. But you know, he did what his constituents wanted him to do. He put in a bill that was of interest to his constituents. And when I'm able to help a constituent, through, for example, cut through some bureaucratic red tape, they haven't gotten a, a check that's been due to them by the state, or, oh my goodness, occasionally you have something. I, I helped a, uh, an immigrant uh, who had a problem with, with um, uh, bad investment and the person ran away with this money and I work with the police department finally I convinced them uh, to bring this before the grand jury um, the Commonwealth uh, Attorney's Office did they got an indictment for this guy they tracked him to California they arrested him on a on a traffic charge in California and had him extradited to Virginia wow. and it was a great it was a great thing because this man could see that that you know in um, uh, in the United States, it doesn't matter how powerful you are, how much money you have, uh, you are equal, you know. And things like that, I think, are, are very beneficial. Uh, I had a bill a few years ago to help the Vietnamese American community on the um, 
uh, flag of the Republic of Vietnam, which is the yellow flag with the three red stripes. And uh, to them, it was a, a critical issue. A lot of people would have said, so what? I mean, I even got opposition from the U.S. State Department on the thing because uh, I was saying that you, you could not fly what is now the Vietnamese flag, which is the former communist flag, in any public place. You'd have to fly the flag of the former Republic of Vietnam, strongly supported by my constituents. It ultimately it passed the House, ultimately died because of the opposition of the State Department. The next year we came back and I put a little twist on it. We called it the Vietnamese American Heritage Flag, and Virginia officially recognized that as one of three flags that we officially recognized. So it was a huge positive thing to the Vietnamese American community. So Bridget, if you're still there, I hope you got the answer you wanted. Yeah, I did. Thank you. All right. Thanks for calling. <laughs> And again, anybody else who wants to call, it's 571-749-1166, and we welcome your calls. You know, we talked about uh, affordable housing, and that brings up, there's been a lot of smoke and mirrors and fear-mongering thrown around Northern Virginia this year and some other parts of the state uh, as political footballs, political ploys, whatever you want to call them on the whole issue of immigration. Now, I think we're a little more mature here in Fairfax. We've had immigration uh, for many, many years here. Uh, my three children went to uh, Jeb Stewart, the Fairfax County High School that the National Geographic magazine yes. called the most diverse high school in the nation. Very proud I had of many Stewart. kids coming through the doors of my house. I couldn't pronounce their names, but right. if you met them now, you wouldn't know the difference between them talking or my mm -hmm. native-born sons mm -hmm. talking. I mean, sure. they're, they're just as American as apple pie. Sure. But, you know, people tend to point at overcrowding. Uh, they tend to point at, at public benefits. And we've got about two and a half minutes before the break. Let's well, let chew me, on that Let me bit. talk about that a little bit, George, because we keep hearing that people want to, you know, curtail all public benefits to people in Fairfax County who aren't here legally. Well, if you don't have the proper documentation, and this has been going on for well over 10 years because we changed our rules when the state changed mm -hmm. theirs and the feds changed theirs, so we follow the law. Mm -hmm. You don't qualify for housing assistance. Right. You don't qualify for food stamps. You don't qualify for energy assistance, for heating and so forth. You don't qualify for an awful lot of things. You, you, you will get immunization for communicable diseases, but you won't even qualify for health clinics. The, there is a federal waiver for emergency. Mm -hmm health care but there's an awful lot you don't qualify for mm -hmm. so you already can't access an awful lot of these things you do qualify um, children who are here whose parents are not here with legal documentation are educated in our public schools Supreme Court has that is a Supreme Court decision that isn't recent That's right. it happened in either 1982 or 1984 mm -hmm. so it's been on the books for a long long time and we want our children mm -hmm. to be educated so there's already an awful lot of uh, restrictions on on what you can get out of the county I've often wondered with all the talk that's been done about Prince William and Loudoun County and quite frankly I could have told the members of those boards what the answer was going to be when they asked that question back in July because we've already been there, done that in Fairfax County. They didn't County. want to hear the answer. They didn't they want to hear the answer. That's exactly right. And so, um, you, you know, we even have, our police department has an arrangement with ICE, with the Immigration and Customs Enforcement. If they, they do an automatic uh, records check mm -hmm. for anybody who's held for a crime. If you find a, a, a detainer on that person, they call ICE and have them come pick them up at the um, uh, adult detention center. They have 48 hours. The problem is ICE only has about 40 beds in the region per month. And you've got a lot more people than that than, that might be held. Well, ICE doesn't bother to come and pick them up. And that region right. is Maryland, D.C., and Virginia. We're going to have to put this discussion on ICE <laughs> until after the break. Uh, my name is George Burke, and we'll be back with you in two minutes. So please stay with us. This is Mommy's bed. Me and Jenny were jumping on it. Mommy's gun fell on the floor. I was a cowboy. Bang, 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 bang. I said, Jenny, wake up, wake up. It's just pretend. But she wouldn't wake up. If you give someone a fish, 
You feed them for a day. Teach someone to fish. You feed them for a lifetime. Give me a fish, and you'll feed me for a day. Teach me to fish, and you'll feed me for a lifetime. Through Volunteers of America, you can help change lives in your community. Mr. Studied algebra in school and got a better job than I could. You take the last cup. Oh, no, 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 Mr. Stuck in an entry level job because you only learned basic math. I don't have a boss riding my butt like you do, so you take it so you can get back to your desk. <laughs> you know, I probably should, but maybe Miss AP Calculus with a $200 haircut in the big office upstairs would like a cup. Oh, no, Mr. What was your name again? Never mind, it doesn't matter. I'm too busy doing important things to care. I just came down for some sweet and stir. <laughs> You know, if my limited math abilities weren't keeping me from getting a better job, I'd quit this afternoon. I don't blame you. But thank goodness you're stuck here because we really need someone to make the coffee. <laughs> Inside Scoop, Virginia. Penny Gross, Mason District Supervisor. Bob Hull, 38th District Delegate. We were talking about issues related to immigration. Uh, ended up talking about uh, overcrowding, zoning, public benefits. Bob, you had something to say. Well, you know, I don't have a lot of sympathy for illegal immigrants because I have so many uh, folks in my district who, who did it the legal way, came, went through the steps. Uh, many people, you talk about the Vietnamese American community, a lot of these folks uh, were boat people who barely left with their lives from their home country. Uh, you have people who have been persecuted in their home country who've come, they've gone through the steps, they become citizens, and it's really a slap in their face to, to at the federal level, to allow some, some type of amnesty, but at the state and local level, my view is, you know, the local police, the state police, their job is not to enforce the immigration laws. That's a federal it's responsibility, a federal and quite frankly, they dropped the ball. They dropped the ball for 30 years. Yeah, the fact that they don't have enough people even for this huge area, I mean, it's just a joke. But the thing of it is, I have uh, uh, numerous immigrant families in, in my district, and I never ask anybody if they're legal or not. And, you know, if somebody calls my office and needs help, I'd be happy to help them. Um, and we have such a diverse community. You know, Penny has done a great job in that regard. She's got this program called Kaleidoscope to bring people from different ethnic groups in. And, and that's what we need. We need to be friendly and warm because, uh, uh, you know, they say you, you uh, what is it, you get uh, uh, more flies with sugar than you do with vinegar. <laughs> So, you know, if, if, you're, if you're mean about it, like uh, apparently in Prince William and Loudoun, uh, you're, you're probably going to, enforcement will probably be more difficult in those counties. And here the police say, look, if, if, you, if you make the immigrant communities um, estranged from the police department, you will get no cooperation solving crimes. Uh, but if you're warm and inviting, then, then you'll get that. And this county has benefited, if you look at the results over, say, the last decade even, uh, we have a, a much greater uh, uh, immigrant population than we did before, and look where we are. I think One the county's better for it. Yeah. One of the things you look at is it, we, we tend to sometimes look at our differences. And when you look at your differences, what you really find are your commonalities. You know, parents want the same thing for their children. Absolutely. They want, they want um, safe streets, and they want a good education. They want clean air. They want clean water. All these things, that's, that's the human condition. Mm -hmm. We all want that. We may come at it from different faces, from different voices, but basically we all want the same things. We want a nice community to live in. And we want a community where laws are enforced, but also where people are respectful of one another. That's what we have in Fairfax County. I fear greatly that some of the draconian measures being proposed in Loudoun and Prince William not only are going to re result in racial profiling, but are going to start creating an atmosphere of racism. And we don't need to see that in Virginia. Virginia had oh, its history a long uh, time ago. We, we have Maria on the phone, and, and Maria's been waiting for some time. Marie, thank you for being so patient. Oh, my pleasure. Um, I, this is for Penny. As um, 
As someone who didn't have a car until my late 30s and used to do it all on foot and by bus, I am really excited about the um, pedestrian footbridge uh, going to be built at Seven Corners. And um, I would like to ask Penny a little bit about the story behind that and what it took to uh, get that to, to where we are today with the groundbreaking coming up on the 22nd. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. You know, this is, this is a story that it actually should have happened a long, long time ago. It was, there was a pedestrian bridge going to be built across Route uh, 50 yep. at, in the uh, Seven Corners uh -huh. area. You know, right there at Patrick Henry and Route 50, we've had a lot of pedestrian accidents, some of which have been pedestrian fault and some mm -hmm. of it which have been driver fault. In 1986, yep. the then supervisor of Mason District, who was one Tom Davis, who is now the congressman from the 11th District, promised that there would be a pedestrian overpass and it took this long when I got into office I said you know we really need to find a way to do this we ended up using some funds because it's a VDOT project mm -hmm. we ended up using some funds that are from the open container law oh, remember yeah. Bob the uh, Virginia had to adopt an open container law to be able to draw down the some federal, federal funds, funds. Right. and and you didn't for a while and finally yeah. you did and that's where the funding is coming from, to uh, some of the funding, to build this bridge. We are doing a groundbreaking on the 22nd of October with VDOT and some folks from the county. It should be completed next spring. It will be ADA compliant mm -hmm. and accessible. And I'm hoping that it will cut down on all of that traffic, oh, yeah. foot traffic that goes across Route 50 and just people take their their lives in their hands Literally. to do this so this will be a nice overpass um, that will be safe for everybody for moms in their strollers it will be for people who may be um, in wheelchairs and it'll just be for all the general public to be able to cross over from seven corner shopping center over to the Wilston area I it's one of my accomplishments I said we're gonna get this done it took it it's only taken 20, 21 years, one years. <laughs> Speaking of accomplishments, I uh, remember during the last campaign, I was listening to Tom taking credit as a congressman for putting in a traffic light by the mosque. And I said to him, I think Penny had a role in that. <laughs> he sort of turned a little red. Yes. Th again, these are pedestrian improvements. Mm -hmm. We work with the state because, again, Virginia Department of Transportation operates and maintains our roads. Mm -hmm. But we have a very good relationship in my office with VDOT, and, and we work together to try to address some of these issues. And the pedestrian issues are really coming forward now. We need to stop killing people on our roadways. We also, I work with Penny's office and also with um, then Providence Supervisor Jerry Conley's yes. office. Uh, to put in a, a crossing area by Lomans Plaza. We were having a similar problem. Yes. It's worked extremely well. We fenced the area to prevent people from crossing over at any point, created a walkway area with an activate, a light that can be activated by the pedestrian. And surprisingly, that's, you know, people thought, oh my gosh, you're going to be abused and people are going to punch It's it. worked beautifully. It's worked beautifully. That doesn't happen. It's allowed for safe crossing. It's worked very well. And that was a case where two supervisors, two that's different right. supervisory districts worked together and we created a big problem. And the fencing will be part of the Route 50 pedestrian yeah. bridge, too, because we've got to keep people from, tr from getting, even right. getting access mm -hmm. onto 50. Fairfax has actually spent a great deal of money on a variety of transportation improvements because there isn't enough state action up here. I understand in terms of turn lanes and the variety of things that the county can in fact fund, which increases the traffic flow without necessarily building a new highway. And we're doing that through our bond funds. And the voters were very generous in approving a bond uh, several years ago. There's another transportation bond on the ballot uh, in, on November 6th. We need these bonds to pass mm -hmm. so that the county can take over some of those uh, intersection improvements that really make a huge difference. I saw an email today from somebody who said, why in the world are we doing 
um, turn lanes at Braddock and Backlick Road. This was somebody in Tyson's Corner. And I wrote back and, oh gosh, and I said, the person in Tyson's Corner probably doesn't ever go through Braddock and yeah. Backlick, yeah. which is one of the worst intersections in the Commonwealth. Yeah. Yeah. And this Sometimes. is going to prevent some of those T-bone uh, intersection um, interactions mm -hmm. which which clog traffic so badly. We have another caller. Susan, we only have a couple of minutes, but I'm sorry to make you wait. What's your question? My question is for Penny Gross. Good evening. Good evening. Um, Ms. Gross, being that you are the Annandale area and I live in North Springfield, one of my greatest concerns is, is what can be done about the day laborers? and their negative impact on the businesses that run between Backlick down to Hummer Road. And I mean, there's a lot of catcalling. There is negative-ism when you go there. I cannot tell you how many times I would go to visit Beltway Mobile to get gas. And one of these immigrants is standing there urinating. Thank you, you for your question. Please. Thank you, Susan. We only have two minutes, so Penny has to answer pretty quickly. We, so. we have, I have a task force, a Hummer Road task force that is working on uh, trying to find a safe hiring site for these folks because um, they, they are looking for work. Mm -hmm. In almost every case, they're looking for work. One of the things that the county did do was fund uh, put some funds aside for nonprofits to work with the day laborers, trying to make some chaos out of the the situation at the corners. Well, we we also the have well, we're 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 also trying to um, the, the police are doing more. We have police patrols. We have especially trained police officers who can uh, patrol that area with language capabilities, mm -hmm. which is very important. But what we really need to find out is we need to find some place for folks to wait safely for um, for work. Mm -hmm. uh, immigration, uh, day laborers have not, it's not a recent phenomenon. It's been going on for hundreds of years. It just so happens that we have a couple sites in uh, Mason District, in Culmore and in yep. Annandale. We're trying to address the chaos that happens. Um, the nonprofit contractor is doing quite a good job, but we still got a ways to go. And quite frankly, the day laborers tell me they don't like the guys who are giving them a bad name because they're there to work. Sure. And I think the other thing of it is the county's view is, as I understand it, is where you see uh, somebody breaking the law, you enforce the law. Have to Doesn't enforce matter the law. if they're an immigrant or, mm -hmm. or whatnot. And Penny's right. Day laborers have been used in the construction industry since. Gosh, my grandfather was a contractor. Used to, you know, as as you would need somebody, you would hire mm -hmm. somebody for the day, and so it's a, a long-standing. Uh, One of the issues in Prince William, where their immigration is predominantly Hispanic, is all the construction that they have had has drawn that's right. folks in to work at that bottom tier of the of the the construction industry, and and now the same people who built their houses, people are complaining because they're living next door to them is basically what's happening in Prince William, I think. We have run out of time. I wanted to talk about environment. I wanted to talk about the parks. You guys are going to have to come back, and we're going to have to do it again. I thank Penny Gross, Mason District Supervisor, Bob Hull, 38th District uh, Delegate, uh, my delegate, my supervisor. Good night. Thank you.